Hey, y'all, this is Troy. So I've got a word from the Lord to share with you today. Uh, this is something that I've been hearing over the last several days. It has to do with witchcraft in the church, specifically among Christian leaders. Now, the Holy Spirit could be speaking about a lot of different levels of leadership. It could be as low as a two-person Bible study, you know, or, or a mentorship a situation where there's a mentor and a mentoree in the church, you know, something like which is one on one, or it could be as high level as, you know, someone with thousands and even millions of, of followers on online or something like that. And an author, speaker, whatever, pastor, teacher, prophet, whatever, whatever, you know, um, whatever's out there, the devil is going to attempt to uh, pervert in one way or another. And he's going to attempt to replace people that God intended to be holy and, and intended to be um, a, a, a righteous reflection of what it looks like to be a Christ follower on earth today is going to attempt to replace those people with his own, um, his own minions, you know, in a sense, like, like people that, and, and I'm talking about human beings, but, but, you know, people that are being influenced by the spiritual um, other than the Holy spirit, you know, and, and the reason he does that is because, uh, Jesus said, you know, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not be able to prevail against it. So the devil knows that the church wins and the devil knows that if the church walks in unity in the faith with one another and stands upon the solid rock, who is which is Christ himself, then we cannot lose the in the spiritual. Now, do we lose sometimes in the physical? Yes, absolutely. There, martyrdom is a real thing, you know, and, and persecution is a real thing throughout history. Yet at the same time, in the, when it comes to spiritual realities and the spiritual forces at work, we cannot lose because we have the victor who is Christ living in us. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. We've already won the war, yet, yet Satan's greatest tactic against the church and against Christians is deception. And one of the main ways that he is able to infiltrate the church and spread that deception and spread lies is through people that claim to be Christian or who are Christians and who are just listening to something other than the Holy Spirit. So that being said, there's the intro. I'm going to be talking about some stuff today that may step on some toes. Um, I am not going to be mentioning specific names. So I'm just going to say that up front. Um, at least not that I'm not that I'm aware of right now. You know, you never know what the Lord's going to do, but that's not my intention. My intention is not to come on here and list off a list of names. Because, you you know, there's that old saying that goes, you teach a man or you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. You teach a man a fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. It's so much better for us as believers to mature into a place where we understand how to recognize falsehood, how to recognize deceit. And in this case, how to recognize witchcraft than it is for us to go, well, that person's a witch or that person's a warlock or this person's demonic. You know, it's like, because if if that is the goal, if the goal is to say, well, that person is is bad, right? We're going to have to do that for the next person that comes along and the next person and the next person instead of each individual believer being able to recognize what's good and what's not for themselves. See, if we were able to recognize and we were able to distinguish the spirits behind someone better as the church, there would never none of the deceiving voices would ever have a foot in the door. They wouldn't have the ability to come in and start deceiving, you know, and, and it would be very easy to recognize them because the, the, the foot in the door that they would have would be in a place where there's, there's no truth being spoken. And there'd be a very fine line between uh, where the spirit of God is dwelling and where the, something else is taking place. Um, so that's, what's happening today is God is drawing the line in the sand and he's separating uh, the light from the darkness, the 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 fact from fiction, the truth from from the lie. Okay, he's separating God's will, what God is doing in the church, versus Satan's agenda. And one of the ways in which God does that is He begins to break down some of the uh, cultish uh, behaviors that we have uh, as as Christians. We we've bought into. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna wait for a second and let the Holy Spirit. Uh, begin to speak into that. Um, as soon as I said that, there are some people listening here. You got a uh, you got a flash of something. You got an image in your mind from the Holy Spirit, or you were reminded of something. And the Lord is following up on what I said. Okay, so that's not for everybody. <laughs> 
if the Holy Spirit's stepping on toes, you better let him step on toes. I'm not trying to, but you know, if he does it, let him do it. Okay. This is a word I got on February 27th, uh, uh, last night. And, uh, <laughs> man, when I heard this, I just was sensing the joy of God so strong that I had a hard time writing this down. Um, but what I heard the Lord say, and then, and then after this in a little bit, I'm going to be sharing nine markers of witchcraft in the church, in church leadership. Okay. Nine markers or identifiers of witchcraft in church leadership. And I'm going to have those on the screen for you. And these are things that the Holy Spirit spoke to me. This is not, uh, this is not teaching today. This is prophecy. Okay. Good prophecy is always going to lean toward what the scripture says. It's always going to be backed up by scripture. It's always good. Prophecy is always going to lean towards teaching and the other way around. Good teaching is always going to lean towards prophecy. Prof prophecy, uh, addresses the issues that are taking place right now, the, the issues at hand right now. Teaching more generally addresses what the scriptures specifically say. So teaching gets real specific about what the scripture says. And, and, it, and it, you know, if somebody brought this from a, the same message from a perspective of a teacher, they would have a lot more points than I have. I have nine points, nine markers, okay? But the reason that God uses prophecy is because God says, hey, here, here's the whatever list it is, 21 markers that you can find in, in scripture or whatever. You know, he, he takes the ones that are the most applicable to those listening in the moment. And he says, here's what you need to watch out for, because this is what's happening in your neck of the woods, in your neighborhood. That's the difference when, when someone's uh, teaching prophetically versus prophesying, you know, with 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 the word behind it. So that's what's happening today, y'all. These these are not the nine most, you know, like um uh, obvious ones in scripture. These are the nine that God spoke to me about. Okay. And so that's what I'm sharing today. Okay. This is what I heard yesterday though. I heard the Lord say, I'm about to uncover three major witches and warlocks who have penetrated my church and replaced those who were meant to be teaching sound doctrine. Some people would say this can't happen. We can't, you know, there's no way that like a witch or a warlock, which just, a, you know, it's just a name for, um, you know, someone who's not, not being led by the Lord, being led by the devil and is, is, uh, you know, undercover in a sense, you know, it's like the female and the male version of that. Right. It's like, that's all that is. And, and it's like, so a lot of people would say, well, that couldn't happen in the church today. But think, think about just for a second, what I said earlier about, what what is the devil trying to do, trying to do? He's trying to unravel the the foundations of the church. He's trying to break apart the church from the inside out. The best way to do that is to have a plant, to have somebody who's not on the same team but is pretending to be on the same team in places of authority, in a strategic place of authority, so that they can start to Im implement lies and they can start to feed people the wrong message. And if the devil didn't wasn't doing that, he'd be an idiot. Okay, now <laughs> he is an idiot <laughs> in a lot of ways, but at the same time, he's strategic. Okay, so he's taking advantage of the strategies that work, and this is one of them. Okay, but the Lord said this in response about these these three major witches and warlocks he's talking about. He said. He said, I'm replacing these quote unquote members. You're talking about members of the church. I'm replacing these members with members of my own. Those who are willing to love one another with a supernatural love more than, than themselves. Thinking of others more than themselves. So God is making a point here. He's saying, I, I'm replacing these people. Okay. He's not replacing them with the most qualified. He's not replacing them with the the ones who have the most faith degrees, you know, on their wall, the ones that have the biggest uh, theological like uh, doctorate, you know, like like thesis, it, like God is replacing them. And God's God's saying, I'm raising up leaders that have fallen madly in love with me. And that all they care about is loving me and loving people. And they may be the lowest of the low, but you're going to see them rise to the top in this season because that's what the world desperately needs. And those are the ones that I'm putting out front. I hear the Lord saying. I I, uh, I heard this yesterday, last night as well. 
Um, the Lord said, there is one in the mainstream media. So he's talking, he's talking about these, these witches and warlocks. He said, there's one in the mainstream media. He's talking about the Christian media, not the mainstream world media, right? I don't think, but I, I believe he's talking about the Christian media. And he says, right at the right at this moment, who is teetering on the fence between my kingdom and the kingdom of this world. Whew. Man, I just feel the spirit on that, y'all. Listen, the, the next thing he said is, you know, I'm going to address what people are thinking, okay? Because that's what the Lord told me to do. Some people are thinking there's no way someone can't be on the fence between uh, Christianity and witchcraft. It, like there's no, you know, there's no way someone could be on the fence between these two kingdoms. And the Lord is, the Lord is saying that there's one right now who's in the mainstream Christian media who's teetering on the fence between the two. There's a mixture happening. That's the next thing the Lord said. He said he's mixing together two separate realms. But then the Lord said this, y'all, and I'm so grateful for the grace of God because he said, but I will bring him to glory as he caves into my grace. And he said, pray for him that he would come home and stop messing around with the darkness. We see a picture of this, okay? We see a picture of this in scripture. We see that many people in the New Testament are getting saved, right? And then Simon the sorcerer comes along and it says that when he hears the message, now he he had been making a lot of money off of the people by performing you know, a magic arts and things. Some of it was trickery and I believe some of it was divination. There was a mixture of, he was being clever and he was doing magic tricks, but he was also into sorcery, okay? So he's kind of doing a mixture of both of these things. And then the gospel message is preached and he hears that Jesus died for our sins. And now when we believe in him fully, we can be forgiven and we can be saved and we can know God personally. Like he hears this message and it says, when, when Simon heard the word, he also believed. And he was also baptized. Okay. So that's his response. And then he sees that when the apostles uh, and the disciples of Jesus, when they pray for people, they receive the Holy Spirit. So he says to them, okay, um, here's some money. It's probably not, you know, a $5 bill, you know, in that time, like it's probably some, something significant. It's a bribe essentially, but it was something that as soon as someone saw it in his hand, they would go, Ooh, I don't want to pass up this opportunity. You know, it was enough money to get someone's attention. And he said, he said, here's some money. Give me this, this authority, this power, so that when I pray for people, they can receive the Holy Spirit. And what he was thinking was, if I have the control over this authority or this power, whatever it is, the ability to, to impart the Holy Spirit to people, if I have the control, then I can put up a paywall between them and the Holy Spirit. And I can start to make money off of this. That's what his, his thought process was. I can put up this paywall and I can say, hey, you're going to get the spirit as long as you just pay me a hundred dollars, you know? And, and once we get the ball rolling, once there's some momentum behind it, that fee is going to go up to 150, maybe in a couple of years when I get real famous, you know, in some of the, you know, I'll, I'll go to some of the, the bigger cities and it'll go up to $200 a pop, you know? And it's like, and, and that's what Simon the sorcerer was thinking. But the word says that he also believed the gospel and he also was baptized. So what's happening here? He was teetering on the fence between two kingdoms, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And what was happening was he was a baby Christian and he was fascinated by the ways of the spirit and by the things of God. But he also had greed and rebellion in his heart. And he was wanting to go back to the old way of doing things. And he was willing to quickly forget the new life that he had found. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole once saved, always saved doctrine and all the little subtleties there, because I think there is a lot of subtlety to it. I'm not going to get into all that today because that's not the main issue. But the main issue is mixture can happen. And when it does it undoes all of the good that God is attempting to do through that person. So I'm going to stop and pray for this person. I don't know who, who exactly God is talking about here specifically, 
Um, but I, but the Lord said, pray for them. And I, I think we need to be in prayer for people. If you come across, uh, I'm going to share these nine markers of witchcraft in church leadership. When you see people in this position, sometimes the Holy Spirit's going to say, Hey, that person's way far gone. You know, like you need to pray for them to get radically saved and, and to be hum humbled and brought to their knees. In other cases, God's going to say they're tormented and they're, they're teetering between two kingdoms and you need to pray for their eyes to be open to the truth and for them to come back home. Because because they're living in a place of torment. So I'm going to pray for this person, Lord, who I, I don't know who this is, Lord, but you know exactly who you're talking about here. God, I just ask that you'd radically open his eyes to the grace of God and any other person that's in the same position that is, has influence over people in the Christian church, God, that you would begin to open eyes to the message of grace and truth through Jesus Christ that you begin to break off the chains, that you would lift the veils, Lord, over people's hearts and eyes and minds, and Lord, and that you would uh, you would separate through your word, separate soul and spirit, God, and that you would begin to draw people unto you through the a pure for, for a pure and simple devotion to Christ, Lord, and away from the deeds of the flesh and away from things like greed and selfish ambition and idolatry, Lord, and back to the heart of God which is for us to know Jesus personally, to walk with him. Lord, I ask that you would make it so clear the importance and the weight of eternity in these, these people's hearts and minds, Lord, that the fear of God would come over them and that they would not be able to move forward without making things right with you first and without repenting and coming back to the truth. In Jesus' mighty name. All right. I don't even know who I'm praying for, y'all. <laughs> so, um, but man, I got on, I got on and I started listening to a lady the other day um, online who people have been telling me about, and I'm not going to say her name or anything like that, but I'm just going to say the, the gift of distinguishing of spirits is a real thing. And if you need that gift, ask, ask God, you know, and I believe he's going to give it to you. Uh, believe that you can receive the gifts of the spirit that you need by grace and through faith because of what Jesus did for you. But man, I got on. And as soon as I started listening, I, I, I start immediately started hearing witchcraft, 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 you know, like it was just constant. And I was like, wow. And this is somebody that has a huge following that a lot of people are listening to. The Lord asked me to talk about freedom. I heard this last night. The Lord said, what is it like to be free? And then he said, he asked this question, is it to have what you want or to know the one who wants you? Let's just think about this for a second. What is behind almost every single sin in this life? You know, every single human being has a deep desire to be loved and to be wanted and to feel like they have a home, to feel found, to feel like they have a purpose, to feel satisfied, to feel like they belong. And the devil will use all of the different things, you know, like fame, money, sexuality, greed, you know, all these different things. Like he'll use them and try to, to tempt people and tell people, if you just have this thing, then that, that, that longing will go away. That longing will be fulfilled. That's, that's deep in your heart. If you just have enough money, then you'll have the friends you always wanted. If you just get out of this relationship and get into this other relationship, then you'll feel satisfied in a way you've never felt, you know, all the, but these are all lies. Because, you know, the, the question God is asking is, what is it like to be free? Is it to have what you want or is it to know the one who wants you? Then the Lord said, this is freedom to know and enjoy the one who saved you. Nothing can satisfy apart from my glory in your life is what I heard the Lord say. Nothing can satisfy apart from my glory in your life. 
And then he said this, he, he said, tell them this, you're never going to find someone in this life who wants you the way that I want you in my family. You need to understand this. God desires to be close to you. That's what the love of God looks like. He wants you. He wants to know you. He knows you already, but he wants you to know him personally and intimately. He wants you to trust him. You can't know somebody without trusting them. He wants you to be set apart in a way where you save yourself for him. It means you're giving, you're giving your heart completely over to him. And that's what true freedom looks like. How does that work? Why does that work? It's because that's the way we were designed. See, the devil always tries to appeal to the things we need the most or we want the most. But Jesus has the real answers to those, those problems. Jesus has the real solution and it's him. One of these days, each of us is going to walk into eternity and we're going to have to stand before him. And listen, I say it that way. We're going to have to stand before him. But the real way that uh, those who know him, the real way that our hearts are saying that is we get to stand before him. <laughs> you know, we, we get to run up to him. If you're listening to me today and that is not a hope that you have in your heart, that you don't have that hope of, Man, one of these days, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand before Jesus and all of my greatest longings are going to be fulfilled. All of my deepest desires are going to be satisfied in him. You need to come home. For some people, you need to stop playing church. For others, you need to throw the world away. It's never going to satisfy you. And you need, you need to come to Jesus today and say, Jesus, I want you to be my all. I want you to be my everything. And I want to know you more than I want to know anything else or anyone else. And I just hear the Holy Spirit saying this right now, from, but, but it's, it's, it's from Jesus' perspective. I hear him saying, I'm here to satisfy you, to, to meet your every need, to give you every single thing that's good that you've ever wanted, those deepest desires, the good ones, I hear the Lord saying, those are from me. But they can only be met in me and through a personal relationship with me. <laughs> Man, I hear the Lord saying, your friendship with the world is only going to lead uh, down a path of destruction. It's only going to lead further into darkness. Now, you can be friendly to the world without being friends with the world. Man, if you're looking, I hear the Lord saying, if you're looking for a bestie, come be besties with me. Not with the world. They're always going to let you down. Uh, they're always going to take more from you than, than they said they would. But I and I hear the Lord saying, but I'm always willing to give you more than you deserve. And even more than you need. I hear the Lord saying this, my friendship with you is worth everything you have to give up to get it. Anything and everything. <laughs> Man, I hear the Lord saying, and this is the last thing. Let me show you what real friendship looks like. So the Lord gave me these nine markers of witchcraft in church leadership that I'm going to walk through. Um, so I would encourage you, uh, you know, this is prophetic. So these are things that God spoke to me. <laughs> I'm going to put them on the screen. You know, it's not... Like I said earlier, this is not a teaching that is comes from deep study of the word, although uh, there's a lot of scripture here. There's tons of scripture here. 
to 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 show some of these concepts in the word but at the same time i would encourage you to pray about these things and say holy spirit number one is this from you number two how do you want me to apply this and i believe that god will be faithful uh to do that for you um so the lord said this on february 25th is just uh, just a couple of days ago like three days ago he said, I want you to identify the markers of witchcraft when it comes to the, to those people listen to, whether online or in person. So he's talking about markers of witchcraft. OK, and obviously he's talking about in the context of Christian teaching or Christian uh, leadership. Um, and so uh, this is the first one. I'm going to jump into this. <clears throat> they often speak from a place of sexual trauma instead of freedom and forgiveness. OK, so. Hopefully, y'all, the, the titles are big enough that you can read on, on the bottom of the screen there. But uh, there's a difference between calling out sin and exposing darkness and reveling in how dark the darkness is. And a lot of times, the, uh, the witchcraft mindset and that witchcraft connection will cause people... And sometimes they think they're doing, they even think they're doing good in the moment. But a lot of times it will cause people to reach back into the trauma of their own past and begin to tell people how dark the darkness is, but it's satisfying a need in their own heart to expose what was done to them. And the demonic agenda behind that, that some people realize, some people don't, but the demonic agenda behind that is to spread the darkness. It's not to keep people free from sexual sin. It's to actually contaminate the thoughts of those who are attempting to follow the Lord. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, you know, and I'm not trying to bash the churches I grew up in or anything like that. I'm not, I'm really not. But when I was a kid, one of the places that I had the most uh, sexual temptation come out of was church. Because they were talking about things in church uh, with the young people that I didn't hear about anywhere else, <laughs> you know, in my life. Because my parents were, you know, attempting to, to shield us and protect us from some things. Now, my parents were willing to talk about stuff in a healthy, good way, you know, and, and to answer questions. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like... We're going to, we're going to quote unquote, expose all these things. And, and the way that the church came at it was, it wasn't just, it wasn't just, these are the wrong things that are out there. It was in the context of, we know y'all are all doing these things. And so it was, and I'm, I'm going to stop there. But the only thing I'll say with that, along, along with that is, the accuser of the brethren brings condemnation and shame along with the message that is supposed to be quote unquote exposing the darkness is it come is the message coming from a place of condemnation and shame or is it coming from a place of freedom and forgiveness so my my story of coming to jesus when i was in college involves sexual immorality you know because i had a an addiction uh and the the freedom that came out of that in uh uh the the freedom that god gave me from that is a huge part of my testimony story but i don't focus on the darkness and i don't think we're called as christians to focus on the darkness i focus on the freedom and the forgiveness and god's willingness to step all the way down into my mess in order to pull me out of it Somebody who's focusing on how deep the darkness goes instead of focusing on how deep Jesus went to pull us out of the darkness is focusing on the wrong thing. Mm. This is what Ephesians 5, 3 through 4 says. It says, but sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be mentioned among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no fil filthiness or foolish talk or vulgar joking, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. So, there must be no filthiness or foolish talk. People, people will disguise filthiness <laughs> and foolish talk under the guise of you need to be aware of all of the 
evil sexual things that are happening out there when it's just not necessary. Now, I'm going to roll back for a second, take a step backwards. Do we need to be aware of some things? Sure. Does it say you should expose the darkness? Absolutely. But there's a difference between exposing the darkness and reveling in how dark the darkness is. Ephesians 5, 8 through 9 says, For you were once darkness, but now you're, you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light, listen to this, the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Saying there's fruit that comes out of, we, we were in darkness, now we're not. Do we expose the darkness? Yes, but you expose darkness by turning the light on. Not by going and sitting in the darkness and seeing how long you can stay. Ephesians 5, 11 through 13, that same chapter says, Do not participate in the useless deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful. Look at this. It says expose them, and then it follows that up by saying, Paul says, For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in the, in the secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. You see the difference there? It's redemption mindset. Everything that becomes visible is light. It's about light exposing the darkness, not us sitting in the darkness and talking about how bad it is. And the devil has used mouths of people who are professing the faith to subconsciously encourage people to go back into sin. Because that's what they focus on, is how dark the darkness is. When Ephesians 5 tells us, for it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. And this is where the distinguishing of spirits can come in. The Holy Spirit can say, something's not right about this. Is this building you up? Is this pointing you to Jesus? Or is this weighing on your spirit? And here's the sad thing, y'all. If we really took a step back, we'd realize it's satisfying a lustful desire in our flesh to know. Like, but yeah, but I, but yeah, but this is a Christian person and they're, they're giving me the details and I want to know the details. There's nothing wrong with knowing. There's nothing wrong with knowing. But if it's satisfying a, 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 a fleshly desire, there is something wrong. You don't always need to know. I don't always need to know. We can move on and we can we can walk as children of light. <laughs> we can walk in goodness and righteousness and truth. Galatians 3 3 says this. It says, Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So people would use this excuse and they would say, Well, we need to know all the deeds of darkness. We need to be able to list them out so we know not what not to do, right? And that's like it sounds a lot like the law of Moses, where it says, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. There's a lot of dark things in there, right? Now, I could go and read that for you. I don't need to. You can go read it for yourself. But people are making new lists today because people are finding new ways to be evil. And Galatians 3.3 3 says, don't be foolish. Walk by the Spirit. Don't try to perfect yourself by the flesh. If you're, if, if you're saying, well, I need to know everything that's evil so I can't, so I don't do that, that's a fleshly mentality, a fleshly way of trying to solve the problem. Instead, we can walk by the Spirit. Galatians 5.16, walk by the Spirit. You won't satisfy the desires of the flesh. We focus on the good through the help of the Holy Spirit, and we just do what He's asking us to do. And listen, we don't need to know everything that's happening in the dark. Philippians 4, 8 says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Another translation says, dwell on these things. For some of us, it would be better just to turn the podcast off and just sit there on the couch and say, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for the redemption that I've seen in my life because of the grace of God. Thank you for the people in my life that are encouraging me. Thank you for the, the, the word of God that I have a freedom to read this. Thank you for the, for your love. Thank you for the fruit of the spirit that's in my life. That's evident that I have peace right now. Thank you for the joy. <laughs> we need, we need, we need to dwell on the things that are good, that are pure,
it, here's 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 what's going to kill that desire. Okay, what's going to kill that desire of the flesh to see all the little de- gory details, you know, and be like, well, but people told me this show is really bad, you know, so I need to go watch it and see how bad it is so that I know to tell other people to stay away from it. You know, it's like what the thing that's going to kill that desire. And I'm not saying that all shows are bad to watch, but I'm saying be led by the Holy Spirit, right? If he's saying no, then don't do it. The what's going to kill that desire is to go look at all the gory details of the cross. It, it it acts like a refining fire. It acts like a like a washing. <laughs> it, it 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 purifies the intentions and the and the motives of the heart. Where you go, wow, man, Jesus, you went through that for me, and then you went through this, and then and then they did this to you, and then you went through that, and then you and you kept going. So that I could walk in freedom. I don't need to know what's on the other side anymore. (laughs) I don't need to know. Here's the second one. Uh, These are the nine markers of witchcraft and church leadership. The second one is they have, and these are things that the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and this is what he's focusing on today. So that's what we're going, that's what I'm going to go with. So he said, they, they have an intense fascination for all things of the spirit, except for the most basic and important tenets or truths of the faith. Uh, This is like Jesus talking to the Pharisees, you know, and he's, he's like, you tithe 10% of your, your mint and your dill. And, you know, it's like you get the the smallest herbs, the window herbs, you know, like you, you, you got the little window basket and you get those little things and you, you literally like, all right, here's uh, nine leaves for uh, my fridge. And here's one leaf to go to the church, you know, nine, nine little pieces, you know, it's like, it's like, he's like, you do the most detailed thing, quote unquote, spiritual thing when it comes to uh, everything you see on the outside, but he says, but you rejected the more important things of the law, like justice and, and mercy. And, and this is the same thing that someone who's operating out of a different spirit or out of a different realm is going to do, who's who's hijacked the church, who's hijacked a position in the church, because they have to talk about spiritual things in order to look spiritual. They have to talk about quote unquote Christian things in order to look Christian, but they're going to, they're going to neglect the most important, the most weighty parts of the law of Jesus Christ. Now the word of God says we're no longer under the law of Moses it says that the old covenant has been made absolute obsolete. We're under a new covenant. Now, do we still read the old Testament? Yes. Do we still learn from it? Yes. Because through the old Testament, we can learn the ways and the character and the nature of God. God never changes the way he relates to his people changes He used to relate to his people under the old covenant and through the law of Moses. Now he relates to us under the new covenant and through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and through us being filled with the Holy Spirit and power. That's the difference there. But the fascination for the things of the spirit can still happen the same way that is happening with the Pharisees. This is 1 Samuel 15, 23. What happens is, and, and I've shared this a lot on my channel, y'all, but the Lord led me back to the same passage again. Uh, the, you know, the King Saul is supposed to wait for Samuel the prophet in order to sacrifice to God. Now, sacrificing is a spiritual act, right? It was something that, co- it was costly. It was a costly spiritual act. And it was supposed to be pleasing to God, but it wasn't in this case. And the reason was because he didn't wait. For the word, what what the word of God had said, he didn't wait. God told Samuel to tell Saul to wait until he arrived to, to sacrifice. Right? And he doesn't. And then this is what Samuel says. Uh, but he also another thing he did was he took the he took some of the he was supposed to destroy the goods instead of taking them for themselves. I think. And he was like, well, I'll take some to sacrifice to God. So Saul was trying to do things his own way, and in in doing that, he was trying to be quote unquote spiritual in as a means of control instead of giving God the control. How do we give God the control? What did God say? Just do that. Just do what he said. It's it's so simple. He means what he says. First Samuel 15, 23 for rebellion is as reprehensible as the sin of divination and other translations say as the sin of witchcraft rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Rebellion, doing things your own way, trying to maintain control while manipulating God to do what you want. That's what was happening. And it says, 
And insubordination, another translation says stubbornness or presumption, like presuming that what God would, would want. Stubbornness, presumption, insubordination is as repre re reprehensible as false religion and idolatry. And he says, since you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So that was the, that was the issue. He was rejecting what God had said. Saul was worshiping God his own way. And, you know, this just reminds me of uh, the Tower of Babel, you know, where they're, where they're building this tower to heaven. And they said, let's reach heaven apart from God, essentially. You know, it, it was it was witchcraft and it was rebellion against God. It was ultimate rebellion against God. And that is, you know, uh, witchcraft in the spiritual sense is a, a, attempting to achieve a supernatural result apart from God's power. But it happens on a more basic level when someone is rebellious or, or manipulative of God as well. Before they ever even go over into the occult and all that kind of stuff, it, it, it starts happening long before that. When someone tries to control God and get supernatural results other than the way that God is saying. And how does this happen without people even realizing it is that they don't even know what he said. They're just doing the thing. They're building the tower to Babel, you know, uh, the tower of Babel. They're, they're doing the thing. They don't even know what God has said because they don't care what he said because they haven't taken the time to hear him. And, and, and that's what this is talking about here. The, the, the sin, and it says insubordination or stubbornness or presumption. I'm just assuming this is going to please God. That's what Saul was doing. God's got to be pleased by this. I mean, doesn't he see how much we're sacrificing here when we could have taken this for our own? Acts 19, 13 to 14 says, Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of Jesus, of Lord Jesus, over those who were demonic, uh, sorry, were, were demon possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. Uh, one day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? What's the problem here? Uh, <laughs> The demons were not going to respond to witchcraft, okay? And unless... Unless it was all for show. But they weren't going to respond and actually leave. Even though these people were saying, they were trying to cast them out in the name of Jesus. Why? These people didn't know Jesus. They didn't know the word. See, here, here's the problem. Jesus is the word. So if we if we try to please God or we try to get supernatural results apart from knowing him, coming to him personally, we don't even realize what we're doing, but we're already operating in a form of witchcraft. There's, there's other examples. I mean, I mentioned Simon the sorcerer earlier. There's Balaam in scripture, you know, false prophecy. There's all the false prophets in the Old Testament who were prophesying presumptuously without getting a word from God. A, a weird word from God is so much better than the most sound and the most uh, perfect sounding false word from God. A, a real word from God that sounds strange and is, is hard to understand is so much better than the clearest and most profound message that God never said. Another example is Saul, you know, the same, same king in the Old Testament. Saul uh, goes to a medium, you know, to hear from Samuel, the prophet, who used to be his connection to God, you know, the word of God in his life, instead of just going to God. He's like, well, I got to get back to Samuel because he was the person that was speaking to me on God's behalf. And to get to him, I'm going to go to this medium or this spiritualist, and I'm going to use witchcraft to try to circumvent this relationship that's supposed to be happening between me and God. This is number three. Third marker of witchcraft in, in Christian leadership. They twist what the word says to fit an, an agenda. 
I already mentioned John 1, 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. The fastest way to rid the church of the glory of God is to replace the word of God with a human agenda. Man, I just sense the glory of God right now, y'all. <sighs> I just, you know, I know this message can seem harsh, and I'm not, I'm not meaning to preach this in a harsh way. I'm just being led by the Holy Spirit, and I'm realizing it's coming out a little more like blunt than normal. Um, but I'm just, I sense that that's what the Lord wants right now. So that's, I'm just going with what he's asking me to do. But as human beings who love Jesus and want his will above all else, Jesus even said to the father, not my will be done at the cross, you know, before the cross says, not my will be done, but yours, yours. We're to model that, you know, we, we have to set our own agendas aside. There are going to be some quote unquote agendas that the Holy Spirit tells us to get behind or tells us to pick back up some things he asks us to support some thing, some, some human organizations or mi- movements or whatever that the God is going to use. He's going to ask us to use at, you know, as vessels for his kingdom in one way or another, or to be a part of, but listen, that can't be our motivation and it can't be the reason. It can't be the reason for what we do. The reason has to be his voice, has to be his spirit, has to be his word. And Jesus is the word. It's got to be him. We've got to know him personally. He's got to be the agenda. (laughs) Jesus has got to be the agenda. And then his glory is going to be there too, y'all. Man, some people you're feeling the manifest glory of God right now. It's because God wants you to know that (laughs) uh, it's time to stop playing games when it comes to why we're here. We are on mission and our number one mission, believe it or not, is to know God. Our number one mission is to know him because if we don't know him, we can't know what he wants. We can't know what he's like. We can't know what we're supposed to do. Uh, it's got to be coming from him. Look at this. Second Peter 1.20 uh, through chapter 2, verse 1 says, But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture becomes a matter of someone's own interpretation. So it's talking about writing. I believe it's talking about writing scripture here, you know, when people are writing it from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But the same applies when we're reading it. You know, what it's saying was God had an intention behind what he said. We can't just twist it any way we want it to go. It doesn't mean anything we want it to mean. It doesn't always apply to everything we want to apply it to. We in the way that the same way that it was written, it has to be interpreted through the help of the Holy Spirit. And we have to understand that God had an agenda. God had an intention for everything he said. And we've got to look at it that way. We've got to say, God, you help me. We've got to humble ourselves and say, you help me understand. You help me to, to apply this. It says, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. But false prophets also appeared among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. So it's talking about destructive heresies, which these are things that are close to the truth, but they're twisting it, right? And, and and witchcraft works the same exact way. It's twisting the word, okay? But look at this. And it says, even denying, so it's, the, it's talking about destructive heresies, and it says, even denying the master who bought them. So it's connecting these two ideas, denying a personal friendship with God, denying Jesus himself, and falling into destructive heresies. Knowing the word, knowing the scripture, is the second best way (laughs) to stay away from deception. Whoa. Ah. The first best way is to know him. (laughs) The first best way is to know him personally. (sighs) 
but we need both. We don't separate ourselves from the word. He is the word. Okay, this is number four. These are, uh, I don't even remember what these are anymore. <laughs> I'm just enjoying the presence of God, y'all. Um, I'll just say this for anyone who's new to like the glory of God. Um, God wants you to experience his glory. Okay. The word says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Joy is not something that we think It's not just a thought in our mind. It's a real experience that we can have with the Lord. And it's something that is actually supposed to be the thing that keeps us going. The joy of the Lord is our strength. <laughs> Apart from the joy of the Lord, I, I would not be able to, to run this ministry. Absolutely not. There have been many times where the, the Lord has said, I want you to share this thing. I want you to talk about this thing. And I'm like, Lord, I don't want to do that. And then God says, okay, here, have some joy. And I go, all right. <laughs> you know, and it's like, well, that's the strength I needed today. You know, I needed the joy of the Lord. I've got, I've got a word for several people listening right now. There are moments that you're about to step into the Lord saying for many people, you're, you're about to step into these moments of difficulty. And for some people, there are going to be moments of pain that arise. And the Lord is saying, I'm telling you this ahead of time. I'm saying this to you so you know where to go for your strength. I hear the Lord saying this. I want you to respond this way when you go into those moments. And the Lord is saying, and I'm going to help you through it. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to be afraid. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I've already overcome the world, Jesus is saying. So this is not a fear. This is not to set you up for fear of any kind. But we all know, y'all, uh, this isn't me now. We all know we go through hard things in this life, you know, but God is God is our source. He's our strength. But this is what the Holy Spirit is saying. For those who are about to go, go through this, the Lord is saying, I want you to respond this way. I want you to say, Jesus has joy for me today. And it's going to be enough to carry me through this. And for some people, you're going to have to laugh through the middle of the pain. <laughs> you're going to have to laugh through the hard thing and say, there's, there's joy on the other side of this. And I get it right now. There's joy right here in the middle of this trial, whatever it is. There's joy right now because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Joy and freedom go hand in hand. If you're free in Christ, you should might as well be filled with the joy of, of Christ. <laughs> you might as well have his joy in your life, in, in your heart. Okay, these are the nine markers of witchcraft and church leadership. I had to scroll up to the top to remind myself of what I was talking about. <sighs> what what which one am I on? I don't even know. I okay, I already I already typed number, I already pushed number four in there. Okay. They, if I can get through this, that'll be a miracle. God's going to help me. They preach righteousness and holiness without giving you the keys to living righteously. And then it, a per, it's a performance-based kind of Christianity. All right. The Lord is telling me to say this. Some people lean this direction without being witches and warlocks, without having gone over into witchcraft. They're slightly in error, the Lord is saying. They're in error slightly. That doesn't mean that you shove them into this place over here, be led by the Holy Spirit and give grace to those who need it. Man, I, I hear the Lord saying that right now. Give grace to those who need it. There's some people that they lean this direction, but that does not make them wrong. It just means it does not make them, uh, it does not mean they're coming from the wrong place. They're listening to me, the Lord is saying, but they're slightly in error. And if we all would take a step back and examine our own lives and our own theology, the Holy Spirit could show each one of us where we're falling into a trap of one kind or another. Okay. So we need to show grace and we need to keep letting the Lord, the Holy Spirit teach us. He is our teacher because God wants to correct the error in our lives. But this is a sign of someone in leadership who's operating in witchcraft is they preach righteousness and holiness without giving you the keys to living righteously. So should we preach righteousness and holiness? Yes. But when somebody says, you better live righteous, you better live holy or else, and then they put a weight on you to strive to do that in your flesh. Now, they're not going to say, 
do it in your flesh. They're just going to tell you to do it, but they're pushing you in that direction and you're going to need the Holy Spirit's help to be able to discern and know the difference. Okay. But when they put you under that, it's just like the Pharisees who wanted control. Man, the Pharisees, they, they had no idea that they were operating in witchcraft. Many of them had no idea, but they wanted control and they wanted to manipulate God apart from a real relationship with God. Through doing all the little things. Second Corinthians 7 1. Look at this. It says, therefore, this is Paul writing. And uh <laughs> first Corinthians, I like to look at it as like the uh the early readers, you know, like the kindergartner, like just getting into it, like fun with uh with with Dick and Jane, right? You know, it's like, and then second Corinthians is like Dr. Seuss, okay? It's it's the Dr. Seuss of the Bible where you're like, you know, you're like uh <laughs> It's like the tongue twisters, you know, like Fox and Socks. I'm not going to try to quote that book, but you can go look it up if you don't know what that is. You get to the end of the book and it's like, did you have a hard time reading this book? Like, good. Like, that was the point. And, and uh, that's Second Corinthians a lot of the time. OK, so it's for the it's for the, the later readers. Uh, but but it says, therefore, uh, having these promises, beloved, let's cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So he's saying, does he say we reject holiness? No. He says we perfect holiness in the fear of God. Do we reject the fear of God? No. This is new covenant. This is under uh, the covenant that we're under today after the cross. And he says, we cleanse ourselves from all defilement and flesh of, of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Okay. But what does he say right before that? How do you do that, Paul? Can you please explain? Like, like I've been trying, right? Many people would say, well, Paul, I've been trying, but I've been failing. How do I do that? Uh, you know, and he's not talking about living perfectly. He's not saying you never make a mistake as a Christian. Some, you know, that is a destructive heresy. There's people that are teach that Christians never sin. And that's a destructive heresy because the word tells us not to sin. And it says, we're not going to practice sinful living. Right. But then it says, when you sin, you have an advocate. There's grace for you. Okay. So don't put a weight on your shoulders that God has not put on you. But it says, let's cleanse ourselves from defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. But it says, therefore, having these promises, beloved. So he's saying, based on the promises you've received, now do this. That's your response. Another, ver another a verse says, this is your reasonable act of, of worship. What promises, Paul? What are you talking about? Okay. So Paul talks about the promises in the, in the couple chapters leading up to this. And right before this, at the end of chapter six, he talks about the temple of God and us being the temple of God, right? And he's talking about how the temple is meant to be holy. We ought to keep ourselves holy, right? How did we become the temple of God? Through the promises. Galatians says, now, uh, this is the only thing I want to know. Did you receive the spirit? What, what is the temple referring to? The temple is saying, saying we're, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. The spirit lives inside of us. Paul says in Galatians, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? How do we receive the promises of God in our life? And how do we become the temple of God? And how do we become a holy vessel that is meant to walk in righteousness and holiness and truth? Instead of striving to get there, we receive it by grace and through faith. He says, hearing with faith means hearing what Jesus did for us and believing it and saying, wow, 2 Corinthians, look at this. This is 2 Corinthians 5. So Paul has got to this point where he's saying, yeah, we, we ought to live holy because of the promises. What are the promises, Paul? Look at two chapters earlier, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. They're not striving to become new. They're already new. They're already new. And this is the old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. The old things are not passing away. They have passed away. <laughs> They're gone. That's how God sees you in Christ Jesus. Verse 18. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He's not reconciling us. He reconciled us. It means he's already brought us into friendship with God through his blood being shed on the cross through his sacrifice. Verse 19, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their wrongdoings against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That's what he was doing. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, 
not counting their wrongdoings against them. Verse 21 says, he made him. Now think about this in the, in the context of, it, he says, let's cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And he says, therefore, having these promises, because we have these promises, what are the promises, Paul? But then let's live holy. He says in verse 21, he says of, of chapter five, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See, Jesus took all of our unrighteousness upon himself that day when he died on the cross. And he said, here, you can have my righteousness. It's a free gift to all who believe in me. It's a free gift. You don't have to strive for it. You don't have to earn it. And in fact, you can't. You can work hard your whole life and you can't earn it. But once you receive this, it changes your heart. It makes you want to live the way Paul lived. <laughs> Where you go, wow, God was willing to give me this. And it's beautiful. And I don't want to mess it up. And you can't. The truth is you can't. Not if you keep believing in what Jesus did for you. But you can you can misrepresent. And, and live like... It, weren't, it wasn't true by going back into the old way of doing things. Paul's saying, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't you remember what Jesus did for you? Don't let your heart slip into an old way of thinking anymore. Keep looking at what Jesus did. You're not going to want to. You're not going to want anything to do with that. You know, Jesus talked about the, you know, address the Pharisees and, and uh, he said, you know, whatever they tell you to do, do that, do as they do, but, 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 uh, uh, I'm sorry, do, do what they're telling you to do, but, but don't do as they do. <laughs> you know, is what he's saying. Uh, and, and he's saying, uh, he says, they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on people's shoulders, but they don't even, they themselves are unwilling to move them so much as with a finger. So they're saying they're, they're putting these heavy burdens on people's shoulders, but they're not going to help you lift those burdens at all. They're just going to keep putting more weight on and more weight on and more weight on. Hebrews 9.14 gives us the answer to this problem. It says, how much more with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Sorry, how much more will the blood of Christ? So he's, what, he, what the writer of Hebrews says is, if you receive the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and you understand what happened when his blood was shed. It's going to cleanse your conscience from dead works. And you're going to want to serve God with your whole heart and your whole life and everything you have left. Because you're going to recognize all of this is a free gift. I don't deserve. I didn't I'm never could. I'm never worthy of it in my own, my my, my best day through my own righteousness. My own righteousness says it's filthy rags, but God has gifted me his righteousness by grace and through faith. This is number five. These, these are the nine uh, markers of witchcraft and church leadership that God gave me. Number five is, I'm going to try to speed this up a little bit. They restore people's hatred for one another and for their past instead of restoring them to a right relationship with Christ. So they're going to keep going over and over and over. It's like a, it's like a, a record player that gets stuck on the same part over and over, you know, just keeps playing the same thing over and over. It's like, it's like, I, well, I finally got over the way I felt about these other Christians or this other people in my life. And, but then it's like, but then I listen to this person. And again, it's like, oh, I'm just so angry about them again. You know, like, yeah, you're right. They're idiots. And that's how we should all feel about them. You know, like, and, and it's like, that's not, that's not the spirit of God. That's not God's heart for his people. His heart for his people is forgiveness and redemption and reconciliation, not, not just between us and God, but between us and our fellow, the fellow members of the body. God wants us to love one another with the love of Christ. You know, the word says, this is how, you, how they'll know you. Jesus said, this is how you'll, they'll know you, by your love for one another. And the other thing that they, they restore that hatred for is the, is, the, is, is the past, but it's not in the good sense. It's not in the sense of, of, of uh, you know, like hating sin or anything like that. It's in the sense of, of hating oneself and unworthiness. 
And Jesus has brought us out of that. You know, I, I'm reminded of, of that song, uh, I'm Coming Back to the Heart of Worship. Man, I have to sing that song sometimes just to like uh, have a heart reset. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm coming back to the heart of worship where it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Whew, man, the, the ones that are operating out of a spirit of witchcraft are making it all about something else other than the heart of Jesus Christ. And it's subtle and it's sometimes it's subconscious, but we know in our hearts when that's happening. There's something going off. There's an alarm bell going off where the Holy Spirit is saying, this is not what it's all about. Look at this. This is amazing. Galatians 5, 13 through 20 says, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. <laughs> okay, so if you want something to hate, okay, and, and you want something to tear down and destroy, it's like those, uh, it, it's like those, uh, it's never going to be another fellow believer, okay? We're supposed to serve one another through love. It, 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 some people are looking for an excuse to listen to country music. You're like scouring through the Bible since you got saved, and you're like, man, I got, I need to find something. I need something, you know, like like freedom in Christ. I know I got that, but like, I, I don't know. Um, I, here you go. Here's the key. <laughs> I'm going to give you the out right here. Just look at, uh, you know, when they're like, I went and I, I ripped up the, uh, I, I got a knife and I, I cut up the, the, the seats of my ex's pickup truck, you know? And it's like, just, how do you feel now about that? How do you feel about that now? You know, uh, just look at it as if that was your flesh. Okay. <laughs> like, like I, I have, I have died to myself I, I, and I, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I live, but Christ who lives in me. It's like, I, like I, I've buried the flesh, man. He's gone. He's dead. That's my ex. And I can hate the ways of the flesh all day long. And that's okay. Don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But serve one another through love. But we should never see, we should never view fellow believers in Christ that way. You know, like it should never be a vengeful thing. It says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, Take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh is against the spirit and in spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. It's okay to hate the flesh in the sense of hating the ways of the flesh. Now, the word's not talking about the spirit is against your body. That's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about the ways of the body. You know, a lot of people will take it so far and say, well, uh, I, 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 you know, I'm no longer, uh, you know, it's like, I'm not going to carry out the desire of the flesh. So I'm going to starve myself and I'm never going to think about my mental health. I'm only going to think about the ways of the spirit. You know, I'm going to like, I'm going to starve my body and I'm going to starve my mind. And I'm going to, I'm going to hurt myself physically in order to be more spiritual. And that's not what the word is talking about at all. It's not talking about your body. It's talking about the old carnal nature. It's talking about the sinful nature. And saying that desire is always going to be against the desire of the spirits. So if you don't want to, if you don't want to follow the old carnal nature, just find out what the spirit wants. Learn to walk by the spirit. It says if you're led by the spirit, you're no longer under the law. You're not going to have to manage the flesh. You're just following the spirit. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft. This passage connects all these all these things together. Loving one another, walking by the spirit, denying the flesh, and witchcraft. John 13, you know, Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you, that you love also one, love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is number six. These are the, the nine signs of witchcraft and spiritual leadership. 
or, 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 or church leadership. They pull from the old covenant more than the new with a total disregard for the life-changing truths, truths preached in the new covenant. Now, again, this is another area where someone can be an error slightly without operating under another, in another realm. Okay. The, this can happen. We need to let the Holy Spirit uh, make that distinction distinction for us because some people do do this to, to an extent, you know, but they, the ones that are true don't ever reject or disregard the truths of the new covenant. Okay. Here's another thing. It's okay to preach from the old covenant and it's okay to preach out of the old Testament. I have friends in ministry who do that a lot and they're very good at it, but the way they do it is through the lens of the new covenant. And that's how we must view the old covenant now is through the lens of the new covenant. And, and a lot of the times it's what they're doing is they're looking at the old Testament and they're saying, wow, here's another indicator of what Jesus was going to do. Here's another foreshadowing of Christ. You know, it's like looking for Jesus in, in all of the Bible, you know, and it's, it's amazing. And we need that. It's okay to preach from the old, but we must preach from the old through the lens of the new. But when we pick and choose and cherry pick the ways of the old covenant or or, or the parts of the old covenant that a, appeal to what we're trying to push, the agenda we're trying to push, while at the same time disregarding the truths of the new covenant, that's when we get into serious error and serious problems. Galatians 5, 1 through 6 says, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, tell you that if you have circum if you have yourself circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who has himself circumcised that he is obligated to keep the whole law. And then it says, you have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. So, so they'll, they'll, they'll pick and choose in order to sound more spiritual and in order to sound holy. They'll you know, be like, look how holy I am. I found this thing in the Old Testament here in the Old Covenant, and you you better start doing this. And they'll put a weight on, on your shoulders, and it's all a ploy to make you think, well, they're talking about holiness a lot. That means they must be holy. They must be righteous. But the Pharisees did the exact same thing, and they were dead inside. And Jesus said it. He said, y'all are whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside and he's saying, he's telling, he's giving y'all good stuff to do. They're giving y'all good stuff to do, but don't be like them at all. He's saying you can do some of these things that they're telling you to do, but don't do what they do because their hearts are far away from me. He says, you have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Falling from grace is not making a sinful mistake. Falling from grace is trying to put yourself back under the law of Moses when the word says we're out from under the law. You've got to focus on the redemptive work of Jesus at the cross. That's got to be the focus. Every, man, I just hear the Holy Spirit saying this right now. Every ministry that I sign off on has at its focus and at its core, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And if that's not happening, it's not ministry. And it's not good. <sighs> because they've rejected the grace of God. And the Lord is saying, and that's the only way to come in, by grace and through faith. <sighs> if you reject my grace, you reject my son entirely. You reject what I've done, I hear the Lord saying. Man, I hear the Lord saying this right now. Don't reject my love. Don't put yourself back under a weight I've pulled you out from under. This is the next verse, Galatians 5.5. 5. For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. By faith, y'all. It's by faith. It says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. Faith working through love. Circumcision here is, and I've said this a lot in my channel, but it's the symbol of the law. That's what he's saying. He's used, he's taking Paul is taking one thing, the symbol that that if you got circumcised, you that was a symbol that you were following, uh, you know, or if your family or your tribe or your nation or whatever was following doing that, it's, it's it was that was the symbol that you were following the whole law, right? So he's taking that one thing, and honestly, because it's the symbol of the law, you could take almost any of the other commandments in the law and put it into this verse. Because that's that's the point he's making. 
That's what I'm trying to say. The point Paul is making is here's the symbol of it. And he's using that to represent the whole thing. Look at this Hebrews eight, six, it says, but now he talking about Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry to the extent that he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. We're under a better covenant. Y'all we have better promises. They're promises that are based on the grace of God. They're based on what Jesus did for us at the cross. This goes back to the same control issue. We go back under the law or people try to push us back under the law. And the problem is they're, they're, they're trying to get us to believe that we can control the issue. Again, we can, we can manipulate God's hands, you know, and it's rebellion and it's witchcraft. That we have the control. We don't. We don't have control. We have to surrender to his grace today. We have to, sur to surrender to the move of the Holy Spirit. We have to, to, to surrender and lay everything down at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, take me. I'm all yours. You own me now because you bought me at the cross when you redeemed me. You own my life. Whatever you say goes. Whatever you want, that's what I'm, that's what I'm about now. This is number seven. Sign of a of witchcraft when it comes to Christian leadership. They put a veil over your eyes so you can't fully see or understand the ways of God apart from them. Not that they're going to fully explain to you the ways of God, <laughs> but they put this veil to where it's like if you if you want to know more, you got to come back. Now that's going to happen with any you know, in, in to an extent with any good Christian leader, because you're going to go, wow, that was. Uh, deep insight into that book of scripture. And I want to come back and I want to hear what you have to say about the next one. You know, what, what God's saying through you about this next book or whatever, you know, it's like anytime there's going to be that there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But what was wrong is when we exalt someone to a place of they are my spiritual leadership and authority and the way I hear from God, when we should all be hearing from God for ourselves. And we should all be communicating with God for ourselves, communing with God for ourselves, not through somebody else, not through another vessel. That's when it becomes manipulation and control and witchcraft. John 13, 8 through 12 says, But as for you, do not be called rabbi, for only one is your teacher, and you are all brothers and sisters, and do not call anyone on earth your father, for only one is your father, he who is in heaven. And you do not be called leaders, for only one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest of you shall be your servant, for whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. This is These are the words of Jesus. I don't have to apply this. This is what Jesus said. I don't have to make it specific, make it work or fit. This is what Jesus said. 1 John 2.27 says, And as for you, the anointing which you receive from him remains in you, the the anointing you receive from Jesus, from him, capital him, from Jesus, okay? That anointing remains in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. This is the Bible. You have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you remain in him. This is good news today. For some people, you can say, I don't need that veil anymore that that person put over me. I don't need that quote unquote covering anymore that, that they said I had to carry. Listen, the word of God says you have no need for anyone to teach you. Why? Because it's his anointing that teaches you. It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's your friendship with God that counts, not your friendship with God through another person. And he's teaching you and he loves you and he wants you to know that he loves you. He wants you to know that he's with you, not just when you're listening to that person, not just when you're close to that person, not just when you've given money to that person, not just when you've used that person's name. God forbid. The grace of God gives you access to the throne room. Hebrews 4.16, let us come boldly before the throne room of grace so that we may find help in our time of need. Whew. 
where it says we have confident access in him, in Jesus. Confident access to the throne room. There's going to be no t-shirts in heaven that say, I'm with so, so-and-so. I'm with them. No, you're not. You're with Jesus, so you're not, yeah, you're not in. You're not in. You're not getting in. I know this sounds harsh, y'all, but I believe the Holy Spirit is, I'm just saying what I, what I sense the Holy Spirit leading me to say, and I believe he's trying to address issues and he loves you. The Lord is trying to address us because he loves you. If this is you, listen, it's better that you find out now. Man, I just hear this from the Holy Spirit. The devil has been able to rob you of the truth that I'm trying to feed you, that I'm trying to give you. He's been able to rob you of the real, true spiritual blessings that I've been trying to pour into your life because you've believed the lie that you have to get those blessings through another human being, those spiritual blessings. When the word says every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus. Hmm. You want to be covered? Come under the blood of Christ today. Now, am I bashing all spiritual leadership, all Christian authority? No, that's not what I'm saying. But it needs to be biblical. And it needs to be led by the Holy Spirit. He needs to have the authority in our lives if a Christian leader says something and the Holy Spirit says something opposite, he needs to have the authority. Listen to me, y'all. If a Christian leader says, if you don't obey me, you're in rebellion, yet the Holy Spirit's telling you to do the opposite. If you do obey them, you're in rebellion. I'm not trying to get people to go against what the spiritual authority is saying. I'm not, trying, I'm not trying to get you to disobey your pastor or whatever. That's not my intent at all. But the Holy Spirit has to be the authority. And the Word of God has to be the authority. All right. I need to move on before I get in too much trouble. I think I'm already in trouble. So. <laughs> Okay, look at this. Hebrews 8.10. Okay, we've been talking about the new covenant, right? And the grace of God. Hebrews 8.10. Y'all share this with somebody if you if you feel like the Lord wants you to share it. But this is the covenant. This is what it says. It says, for this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declare, declares the Lord. This is Old Testament prophecy being reiterated in the new covenant, in the New Testament. It says, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. What's he saying? He's saying, I, I speak to them in their heart. He does that through the Holy Spirit. I give them the mind of Christ, but it's also, I will be their God. They shall be my people. This is going to be personal between them and me. And then he says, and they will not teach each one his fellow citizen and each one his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. The greatest in the kingdom shall be your servant. So be your servant. He's saying here, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest. There's no hierarchy in the Christian church. Paul says about the apostles, we, we were considered the, the slime of the earth, the, the dregs of the earth. You want to be a prophet, you want to be a, an apostle, you'd better learn how to serve people. And you'd better be willing to go lower than those around you. Because if you're not willing to, you're not a real prophet and you're not a real apostle or you're not a real teacher or you're not a real pastor. Because guess what? Those people can find Jesus for themselves. They don't need you. They don't need me. And if we're not willing to humble ourselves and serve other people, then what on earth are we doing? I 
I try to stop. I tried to stop before I got in trouble. Now I'm all the way in the pit. <laughs> There's no way to get out now. <laughs> Can't dig myself back out. Okay, here we go. <laughs> oh no. Okay, well, whatever. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Maybe don't share this. I don't know. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding, y'all. I hope I hope y'all can hear this with grace and with love. But man, the Holy Spirit's trying to, he's stepping on toes today because he's he's trying to make a point. Because he loves us. He's not mad at you. He's not mad at me. He, he loves us. He wants us to step into all that God has for us. He wants us to mature. He wants us to be in a place of health. He, man, he wants the joy of the Lord to, the, to, to, to be pouring out of our lives. The fruit of the Spirit. And that's this is the next thing, actually. It leads me into number eight. The eighth sign of witchcraft in Christian in the in in the church or in leadership in the church, they produce the fruit of wickedness in your life. Things like darkness, depression, fear, anxiety, intrusive thoughts, etc. I don't have to dwell on this for very long. I'm just saying, you know, when the fruit of the spirit's not there, the fruit of the spirit acts like a a. Uh, a, a, a measuring tool where we can know what's, you know, what's coming in, what's pouring in by what's coming out of the heart. Galatians 5 22 says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, which is also a way of saying patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things. There is no law. This is why people can put a heavy weight on someone's shoulders and tell them you better live holy. But then it's like, but then they walk out and they feel like they have no self-control. So then they feel like, well, I have to come back and I have to get beat up again so that I can just try to have patience again. No, I can try to have self-control, you know, and I need to hear about how terrible I've been doing when, when Jesus is something opposite. Jesus says, just ask to be filled with the spirit. And you'll have all the self-control you need because it's a fruit of the spirit. Luke 11, 9 through 13 says, ask and you shall receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. What are, what are we seeking? We're not, we're not seeking to improve ourselves in the sense of I'm going to strive really hard to be the best version of me I can be. Now, should we live righteously? Yes, but he's, we're, we're seeking him. We're seeking the filling of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because apart from him, we can do nothing. We've got to realize that. We've got to get to the end of ourselves. We've got to get to the end of our ropes. We've got to, we've got to understand our own weaknesses and begin to exalt in the strengths of God and say, Jesus, apart from you, I can do absolutely nothing. I need you to fill me with your spirit. I need the fruit of the spirit in my life. I need you to come in and do for me what I could never do for myself. And there's going to be this love and this joy and this peace that comes out of that, you know, and this self-control where you're like, well, I, like, that's weird. I, I like, I didn't even feel like, get, le like falling to that temptation today. Like, it, it's weird. It's like, it's like the, the the uh the the temptation lost its power you know it, it's like man what what's going on here that's the fruit of the spirit that's the holy spirit that's that's when you feel wrapped in his arms he's your comforter you know and and you feel like he's your friend it's it's like you feel like he's right there and he's he's satisfying those desires and those needs and and you don't even the temptations lose their power and and they lose their shine and, and you look and you go, oh, why, why did I ever fall for that trick? You know, why did I ever think that was that was good? You know, that's what it's like to be loved by the Father, to, 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 to rest in what Jesus did, to have to be filled with the Spirit. That's what freedom is like. You're free from those things. Why? Because you're being filled with Him. You have everything you need. Look at this. And the next verse says, those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Be friends with him. That's what it's saying. Be friends with the Holy Spirit today. Let him into your heart. Let him into your life. 
Make his friendship a top priority. For some people, what you need to do, and I just sense this from the Lord as an impression, but but what you need to do for some people is you need to throw off the religious side of prayer and worship and waiting upon the Lord. Stop making it religious. Instead of coming in every time, it's like, well, it's time to pray. I need to quote Psalm 91. I need to quote this. I need to do this. Instead of doing that, come in and speak to him as if he's a friend. And as if he's right there in the room, not as if he's far away and you're trying to get him to come or you're trying to catch his attention by saying the right things. No, to talk to him as if he's right there with you because he is. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's already living inside of you. He's, he can't get any closer than that. <laughs> Just say, Holy Spirit, you, you are the priority today. Like, will you, will you help me to to listen to you today? Will you help me to walk by the Spirit? Will, will you help me to, to, to love people the way you love them? Will you help me to feel the love of the Father today? And sometimes that's all you need to do. <laughs> you know what the Lord just said? I just heard him say so clearly, he said, yes. He just said, yes, I'll, I'll help you do those things. <laughs> it's as easy as that, y'all. Sometimes it's all it takes. Why? Because it's all based on the grace of God. It's all based on what Jesus did. You don't have to perform for God in the prayer closet. It's not a performance. It's a friendship. You don't have to fast to hear God's voice. He, he wants to speak to you. He's waiting to speak to you. He's already speaking. Sometimes you just have to get quiet and believe that he's going to. All right. This is the last one. These are the nine signs that God gave me of witchcraft. Uh, <clears throat> nine markers of witchcraft and church leadership. Okay, here we go. This is the last one. They often place you under punishment as if the punishment has not already been received by Christ. I was watching a I was watching an episode this week of an old 90s TV show. And the theme of the show was the look. So it was like the husband, you know, it's like goofy husband, you know, sitcom type of thing. And the theme of the show was the look where it's like he was doing everything to avoid getting the quote unquote look from his wife, you know, and it's this look of like uh, just like a stern, like, you know, you know, you're about to, all hell's about to be broken loose over you. If you don't do what I'm telling you to do right now, that kind of look or whatever, you know, and they obviously made a lot of jokes about it and stuff, but, but the Lord told me, I, I started watching this show and the Lord said, Troy, I want you to listen to me while you're watching this. Cause I have something to say to you. And I was like, all right. And so I had to pause it in the middle of it. And the Lord said this, he said, I don't want to motivate my body that way. I'm talking about his people. I don't want to motivate my, my body that way. He said, there is another kind of look that my heart is hoping you will respond to. And the Lord is talking about the look of love. I just got to, uh, I just got to interview uh, Randy Kay uh, yesterday um, about his new book called Heaven Stormed. And I'll probably be releasing that video in the next couple of weeks. But he talks a lot of, in that book about his encounter with Jesus in heaven and some of the things that he saw uh, when he passed away in the hospital, you know, and then came back. And, uh, you know, it's one of those books where you uh, if you're not used to that kind of that kind of stuff, you're going to have to say to the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to say, Holy Spirit. I don't know what to think about this, but if this is you, will you show me? You know, it's one of those things where you kind of have to get his, uh, you know, especially if you're not used to that kind of stuff, you're going to have to get his confirmation on it, right? And I think we always should with stuff like that, with prophecy too, with 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 anything, you know, like that's that's spiritual in nature. We need the Holy Spirit to confirm it to us if we're not sure. But, you know, it's one of those things where he talks a lot about, uh, you know, this experience with Jesus. And what I kept seeing in the Spirit as I was reading it, I kept seeing Jesus's face 
and his eyes, you know, and it's like, and I've seen it so many times in my life where, where, where I'm, I, I think that Jesus is going to look at me one way. And then when I, when I, when, when he shows me how he's really looking at me, all I see is love. All I see is like, it's like a, the, the most love you could ever fathom. You see like a tenderness and, and like a care and a, a selflessness. And it's like, you, you realize you look into Jesus's eyes and you realize you love me like more than I love me. Like, how is that even possible? <laughs> you think, you think more highly of me than I even think of myself, you know? And, 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 you want what's good for me even more than I do, you know, like, and, and, and it's like, it, it's the kind of love that we all deep down long for. And it's the kind of love we all need. And it's, it's the motivating factor in the Christian life, the love of God. And this is, this is the final point God gave me. I heard the Lord say that he said this about people that are operating out of that place of witchcraft. He said, this is how they control a lot of my people through manipulation and punishment if they fail to comply. And a lot of times this goes over into the spiritual realm. It doesn't have to, but a lot of times it does, you know, into, well, if you don't do what I tell you to do, God's going to curse you or something like that. But listen, it's a lot more subtle than that as well. Anything that is trying to get people is trying to control people out of manipulation or fear of punishment if they don't comply is leaning in that direction and is going over into that realm. This is John 3, 18. Well, the Lord said this as well. He said, so this is the final point. They often place you under punishment as if the punishment has not already been received by Christ. And he said, they place you back under a judgment you've already been taken out from under they place you back under a judgment you've already been taken out from under look at this john 3 18 as a christian you need to understand this jesus says the one who believes in him is not judged let me say that again the one who believes in, G in jesus talking about himself he said the one who believes in him is not judged the one who does not believe in him has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of god the one who believes in him is not judged. Why is that? Because he took the judgment upon himself. Has the judgment been passed? Yes. But he put himself in our place. And the penalty has already been paid. And the way to receive that gift is through belief, it's through believing in what Jesus did. Hebrews 9, 12, it says, And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all time, having obtained, obtained eternal redemption. It's talking about eternal redemption for us, those who believe. It says he entered the holy place once for all time, having obtained eternal redemption. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. He's talking about those who are believing in him. Okay. And it says he's going to come back without reference to sin. Why? Because through his own blood, he already obtained eternal redemption for us. He already took the judgment upon himself. Come out from under the weight of the law today and the curse of the law. Jesus has become the curse for us when he hung on the cross. Come out from under the weight of the voices of those who are operating in the realm of darkness, not the realm of light, in the kingdom of the enemy instead of the kingdom of God. And know the truth, because Jesus said, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. True freedom is not just head knowledge, it's knowing him 
Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. So knowing the truth is not just knowing another biblical fact. It's knowing him. And we can all know him through believing in what he did, being filled with the Holy Spirit. I hope this has been encouraging today. I know it's been a lot. I know it's been kind of blunt and just <laughs> potentially harsh. Um, but I, I hope that uh, I hope this has been good. Um, Jeffrey said, had many of these done to me in my formative years as a Christian, it robs freedom and joy. Yeah, it does. It does. Y'all, here's the crazy thing about it is, I, you know, it's it still happens to me today sometimes, you know, where I, I get into something and I start listening to something. And then, you know, it's not always like the worst thing ever, but it's like the Holy Spirit's been saying like, nope, that's not good for you. You know, you don't need to go down that rabbit, that rabbit hole. And I have to take a step back and I have to be led by the Spirit. Penny says, sin shall not have dominion over us. So true. The word says, uh, you know, we're no longer under the law, but under grace meaning that sin doesn't have dominion over us. Like it's like once we get the grace concept down and I'm not talking about hyper grace, I'm not talking about, you know, progressive Christianity. I'm talking about true biblical grace. Once we get that down, we get freedom, not just freedom in Christ, uh, you know, away from some of the uh, ceremonial laws, uh, you know, and that kind of stuff that people try to follow, but, but we get freedom from sin. It's both, both things. Uh, <laughs> Somebody's asking, were you watching Everybody Loves Raymond? No, that was that was not that was not the show I was watching. I was actually watching Home Improvement. So um, there you go. <laughs> uh, Stephanie M says, Love Randy K. I'm in the middle of reading that book and love it. That's awesome. So yeah, if y'all want to see, I actually have a copy of the book here. If you want to see the book I was talking about, Heaven Stormed. Uh, I'm in the middle of it as well. I've already interviewed him, but I I skimmed through, I read through like the first third of it. And then I skimmed through a couple other chapters just to be able to like talk to him. But I was, I'm in the middle of reading another book too. So it's hard to be, to get through. I had like four days to try to get through this and it's, it's just hard, but I'm going to finish it because, uh, because it's, it's so good. <clears throat> um, Del Thornton, I encourage you, uh, since you're talking about Trump specifically, I encourage you, I'm not going to address that here since the, the theme is so different than what I'm talking about, but I would encourage you to go watch some of my recent videos about Trump uh, because I believe if you if you actually go listen to the messages there, you'll see that I'm not coming at it from an agenda-driven perspective, but I'm coming at it from a biblical perspective and, and from a Holy Spirit perspective as well. These are things that I believe God has showed me, but it's also stuff that can be backed up by Scripture and by the Word of God. So I would encourage you to go to go to go uh, watch some of those. But at the same time, I'm in a I'm in a position where if I ever need to be corrected in any certain area, my heart is to want to be willing to be corrected first off by the Holy Spirit, and then on top of that by other believers as well. Because the you know the word says that as iron sharpens iron, so one believer, you know, or one person sharpens another. <sighs> Johnny Mitchell says the law doesn't save, but proves to us that we need a savior. That's so true. You know, it says, uh, you know, Paul says the law was the tutor to lead us to Christ. You know, so it's like, we, we know that we need a savior. You know, once we, once you start reading through it, you're like, wow, no one could ever do this, <laughs> you know? And the point was to point us to a savior. All right. Well, I hope uh, Gail says, God bless you. You've given me a stronger sense of hope and peace. Well, praise the Lord, Gail. That, I believe that's the Holy Spirit working. All right. Well, I love y'all. I'm going to hop off. All right. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. This was long. But again, I love y'all. Uh, and I, let me just pray for y'all before I jump off. 
Lord Jesus, I just ask that every single person listening, Lord, that you would help them to have the best week of their life, not because of every, the way everything goes, Lord, but because your spirit is with them, God. And I just ask for a greater filling of the Holy Spirit for each of us, God, this week, uh, that we would just have a greater awareness of your spirit with us, Lord, but you would, Holy Spirit, that you just be bringing up the word of God every single time we need it, even in the little things, that we would have the exact words that we need uh, right there in that moment, Lord that we would sense the love of the Father, the nearness of the Holy Spirit, and that you would continue reminding us of how valuable we are based on what Jesus did for us, Lord. That you would constantly uh, be leading us and guiding us and directing us and just filling us with your peace, your joy, and your love. Lord, I ask that this would be the most peaceful week that everyone listening has ever had because of you, because of your presence and your filling. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I love y'all, and I'll see you next time.